Okay, so let's start with the status update. So last year we were talking about avoiding um, frame copies for the ESP data path. And there, the problem were that most of the ESP data frames were linearized during the journey to the kernel. And that time it was already solved for RX and TX, but the uh, code was still in RSC version. So this code were merged in February. So good. And unfortunately, already last year, a new problem appeared with that because some of the crypto algorithms do the linearization of their own. So it was solved for some crypto algorithms, for others not. And unfortunately, this is still the case, so nobody worked on that. So still work to be done here. OK, so far with the frame copy. The next topic we had last year was uh, we wanted to add a zero code path for IPsec. So, and last year we already implemented zero handlers, but code were in RFC version. This code were split. First part were merged in February, where we started to use zero cells for IPsec. And then in April, the layer two decapsulation code were merged. So, with these two, zero works for IPsec now. So we are done there. Also, we wanted to do something for the TX path, namely the GSO code path we wanted to change. And we wanted to move the existing GSO handling out of the transformation layer down to the GSO layer, which is based on layer two. So last year, it looked like that. We had working code, but only if we can offload the crypto operations to NIC. So we had RFC code that time, which was merged in April this year. So with that, the GSO works for hardware offload, but unfortunately, it's as last year, we have no solution for software crypto. And why is that? The problem was that we were not able to handle asynchronous crypto operations in the GSO layer. We were not able to unwind the call stack. So that time we just deferred because there were no solution in sight. So the situation changed here a bit. So far we have a solution which is still in our C state and I hope we can merge this during the, well, next month I hope. So that's GSO. Another thing we talked last year is we wanted to implement an IPsec hardware offloading API. Last year we had the API in RFC state. Code were merged in April. And with that, IPsec hardware offloading is fully implemented. We have the API and the GRO GSO callbacks, so would be possible to use it from that point on. Last year at NetDev, Melanox was working to integrate their driver with the API. And this code was finally merged in June. So we had the API and the first user of the API was kind of good now. And during the last year, two new things happened. One thing is that Intel started to work to integrate their hardware with IPsec offload. And the second thing is that Oracle start to work to get the existing Niantic 10 digit drivers work with IPsec offload. We will hear later more about these two. So that's the state of IPsec offload. Last topic we discussed last time was the flow cache removal. We had a discussion about that last year. And finally the flow cache were removed in July. This means that the denial of service problem with the flow cache were solved when we removed it, but unfortunately, we have a new problem here now because the flow cache um, provided a fast lookup for policies in SIS and some scenarios with a lot of policies in SIS might be very slow now. Unfortunately, there is still no solution right now, so this is work to be done. Okay, that's more or less what happened in the IPsec subsystem during the last year. So that's the update, and we can start with the presentations. I think Shannon wanted to start. Or Maybe yes, if you have, sure. Yes. 
everything? Yes, we can, and actually we do. I think for the offloading, it's not not a problem anymore. Yeah, the problem is that um, the ASNI code, for example, um, is not um, scale gather aware, so they need to do linearization before they put the, them down to the crypto engine. That's why some algorithms still do the linearization and others don't. I mean, we can get around this entirely if we update the crypto layer, but the crypto developers have to do that, obviously. Yeah, sure, go ahead. So, uh, Jero said that we already have that, but have you considered post Jero also that Jero can have uh, I don't know, for this case, What do you mean by that exactly? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, you're talking about some code of what would Yossi post? Yeah. yeah, I mean the problem there was that this doesn't work if you do not offload a sequence number handling, right? No. What do you mean? I mean, so you, I think you're talking about to cut out a trailer, right? And of course. Yeah. Yeah, I think there is some work to be done. This doesn't work out of the box. Of course. Yeah. I, I'm not talking about yeah. this. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, in the past, we did the linearization um, in the ESP layer generally we, we, for almost all packets. We changed this, and now we just pass it to the Scalagala and pass it down to the crypto. But then the, some of the crypto algorithms look at this, and if it, this is not a linearized packet, then they linearize, because some of the crypto algorithms are not able to do Scalagala. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 no, you, you take the, um, the crypto job you, you gave them, and if this is a scatter gather entry with more than one entry, then the crypto put everything together and pass it down, down and do the crypto. Okay, so it's not all, not all the No, no. Okay, anything else? I mean, we have time for discussion later on. I think we should continue with the talks that we've gone through, okay? Hi, uh, my name is Shannon Nelson. Um, I'm really fairly new to this, uh, to the IPsec stuff, so uh, bear with me as I stumble through uh, a few of the concepts. Um, I used to work for the Intel group, uh, and so that's how I ended up on part of this. Um, but for the quick overview, uh, the Niantic, the 10 gig, family from Intel does have IPsec hardware offload. Um, uh, I have some patches in development and the basic encryption decryption offload is working. Uh, just don't wait for it. Uh, it's kind of slow. Uh, partly, for, partly because of my own choices in getting the initial stuff working. So why do I care? Well, uh, Oracle has several database platforms that, are, um, that work around the Niantic chip. They have a lot of data going back and forth in their own database stuff and then getting their database and making the, the results of their output uh, available. Uh, and so it'd be nice, to, nice for our customers to be able to encrypt their, their work and they already have the hardware to do it, so let's go enable that hardware for them. Uh, it's something to also work on while we drive Intel to do the right thing on their next pieces of hardware, since 
I know some of the people working on it. Uh, I used to work for Intel, and I worked on these drivers before, so I had a little bit of idea what I was getting into. And Sal Many said, go do this. Okay, you don't argue with Sal Many. So I may have this timeline slightly wrong, but the initial uh, support, the initial NIC uh, hardware came out around 2008, 2009. Um, there was no offload support in the Linux stack, so we just didn't do anything. Uh, meanwhile, the Windows folks said, haha, we can do it, so they did it. And then they promptly kind of forgot about it, and I've had a hard time trying to get their attention, saying, hey, how did you make this part work? Uh, last year, um, I don't know if Salmoni started it, but I know she was browbeating poor Josh and Don and Anjali saying, hey, get this working. We want it. We want it. And uh, Josh did a, a nice job at getting it started and then uh, was told, go work on something else for a while. Um, this summer, I had a little bit of, a little bit of time and uh, Salmoni said, hey, we have the offload in the stack now. Uh, you have some time. Go work on this and, and help us get it working. And I said, well, sure, okay. Um, we, see, we saw that Mellanox had it. Um, I see someone else just posted patches. I don't remember who it was. Uh, someone else just posted patches for offload. And I think it was just last week. Uh, you remember who that was? Mm, not exactly. I've seen them, but I don't know. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to look through their patches. So, like I said, I was a little new to the IPsec stuff, so I had to go digging around, um, looking through the public data sheets about what is IPsec, um, looking at the public data sheets for the uh, IXGBE um, driver and the, the Niantic, because when I left Intel, they didn't let me take the non-public data sheets with me. Um, went through the Mellanox and the, uh, a lot of the XF, uh, uh, XFRM code for hints as to what to do. Um, studied Josh's code and, and uh, poked and cajoled my friends at Intel for uh, some help. The basic theory with this driver is, um, you know, first of all, you set the flag saying, hey, I can do the offload. Um, but if you try to start, try to tell the chip to start preparing for the offload, it's going to suck down a bunch more power. So figured, okay, we won't really set up the chip for it until we actually have an SA to unload, uh, to offload. And so, we don't start the actual chip engine until we have something to work with. In the meantime, we set up some uh, software tables to keep track of all the info. Uh, we set up our offload operations for XFRM to C. Uh, and then when we actually want to start stuff, we have to shut down the chip uh, data paths, let them drain for a moment, do a little tweaking of the, the inner gap, inner, inter, I never can say that right. <laughs> Interframe gap, um, and then start the offload engine. When the uh, when the uh, stack comes and says, "Hey, here's here's something we want you to offload," uh, we go shove it into the chip tables. On TX, um, we've got uh, 1,024 offloads that we can do for SAs. 128-bit uh, key, 32-bit salt for just the one, I didn't write it down on here, just the one uh, encryption that it does. Uh, for Rx, we've got tables for the key, the salt, for the SPI coming in, um, the mode, basically is this an AH or an or a, a ES, uh, ESP, uh, and the IP addresses. Again, we've got 1,024 offloads we can do, but only 128 IP addresses as targets. Yeah, it's okay. We can have lots of offloads for a single IP address, and so this, this allows us to do some multiplexing of the tables. Now, Intel did something interesting. They used uh, some content addressable memory in their hardware, which um, took me by surprise at first until I read some of the, the small print. Um, it's, I don't know how this stuff is implemented, but you give it the basic you give it the lookup information and the hardware sucks it in and just runs it across all the tables and quickly comes out with, here it is, out of your table. It's like, oh, that's cool. Uh, what you have to remember though is that doesn't act like normal memory and so it doesn't get cleared on reset. You have to go and do your own cleanup um, before and afterwards. And then to load those tables, 
uh, you've got a set of tables, but you've only got one register that you're bouncing stuff through. So you load your IP address in the table, you set the index it's going to go to, and say go, and the chip puts it in the table. Then you do the next one. Uh, in order to read what you have in the table, it's the same thing. You set the index, you say read. It gets loaded into that bounce register, and then you can read that register out. Takes a little extra time, but you know, all right, it works. For TX, um, the basic offload, uh, XFRM um, is setting up the whole packet structure, sets up the ESP header for you, but doesn't encrypt the data, and then hands it to you and says, here you go, and here's the SA, off in a, a pointer off from the SKB. So the driver has to go look at that, and in uh, our case here, the driver sets up a context descriptor that has some of the information, and then the actual data descriptor. So you end up with two descriptors for this one packet to get sent down. The information gets sent down, the driver looks at it and goes, oh, okay, cool. Does the encryption and shoves it out the door. The driver does the encryption of the packet, uh, and if we're doing TSO uh, uh, or um, check some stuff, it'll do the uh, tweaking of the, of the context numbers as we go along. Rx, uh, similar to the engine, watches for the IPsec he headers. If it sees an IPsec header in the stack coming in, it will look at the IP address that it's headed for, and it'll find the uh, SPI number and go searching through the tables, say, do we have an offload for this? If we don't, well then, fine, just shove it up the stack. If we do, go try to do the encryption, set a bit for success or fail, and hand that back up. Uh, the driver then has to look at that and say, oh look, the, the uh, chip found something. Unfortunately, the chip doesn't tell us actually which SA it was. And so then we have to do in software our own table lookup to find out what it is. That's where part of my speed is gone right now is I'm not doing anything fast. I gotta fix that later. Um, so we do our status lookup. We set up the uh, SKBSP and hand that back up the stack, make that available. XFRM then goes ahead and pulls the header apart. It doesn't have to do the, the decryption because we've already done it. So current status, it works, yay. Uh, not very fast and only for IPv4. Um, the biggest issue was just getting this tweaky little hardware to do anything for me. Um, yeah, yeah, we've got specs, but you know how specs go sometimes. Uh, they don't tell you, you really got to do it exactly in this order and make sure you do a couple of flushes here, make sure you do this. Um, finally, I, I got some guidance on how the Windows people did it X number of years ago and was able to get our code working. Uh, checksum and TSO offload are not working yet. Uh, that's the thing I was just recently looking at. Um, and so we just won't even talk about performance right now. So there were challenges, as anything goes, um, and we ran into a couple of, uh, as I'm stumbling through the API and making my own mistakes, nothing points out a mistake like a, ker a kernel crash. And so I came whining to Steve Stefan saying, it broke, and we found a couple of patches to f stick in there, and he said, don't do that. I said, well, it shouldn't crash anyway. Um, so I fixed my code so it wouldn't do this, and then he fixed the, uh, the upper layer code so that even if someone else does it, it won't break again. Um, I'm sure there are other issues we'll run into, but now as I get a little more familiar with what the stack is doing, maybe I won't have to whine to him quite so much. Okay, here's the big thing. Um, as, uh, as we heard uh, from Harold, documentation is really a good thing to have around. Um, and this is one of the things I'm going to try to take care of uh, over the next couple of months is from my perspective now that I've gone through this, instead of being one of the em uh, Emulex or Mellanox folks helping build the API, I think I'm one of the first consumers of this. It took me a while to figure out, okay, how do I need to put this together? I've got some notes, I need to write those notes down and we'll work out some, some sort of readme for those. Um, IP route two, man, I hate that command line. <laughs> okay, it, it's great once you know 
which things you need to put where. But it's a really wonderful example of why man pages are not a learning facility. Um, they're wonderful to help you remember what it is you learned the hard way somewhere else. Uh, I, I'm not sure what to do with those yet, but we'll, we'll look at those. And then, of course, there's the official data sheets. I, PJ and I uh, teach a driver class at uh, uh, Portland State University, and one of our favorite, uh, one of our favorite assignments for the young students. Now, these are hardware engineering students. Typically, we're teaching them how to write a driver for hardware, so they're not great software engineers yet. And they're hardware people. They've they have looked at specs a little bit. We tell them here, here's a go get this spec from Intel. It's the spec, so it must be right, right? Yeah, for, the, for one of the uh, one gig devices. And we tell them, there, here's how to read and write registers. Here's, here's the information on how to do an LED. Go make that LED blink. Read the spec, it'll tell you, kinda. Uh, we give them extra time on that one because it, it doesn't really tell them how to do it. And it's wonderfully, wonderfully exciting to see their eyes get wide. But, but the spec, yeah, specs lie. In real life, specs lie. Don't expect the professor to get it right for you in real life. Uh, further challenges. Um, oh, this is kind of an extension of all of the documentation tied together. We have stuff that comes in on, in network order. Great. We have stuff that comes down the stack. And I was been working on both Spark and x86, so I have to deal with this byte swapping stuff. And when you've got something that comes down the stack, it's supposed to be set into network order. I think it's supposed to be network order on this chip. Is that what the spec is telling me? Okay, but what order am I getting it from the stack when when it gets handed to me? There's a lot of experimentation that goes. Should I? Well, it, it, let me try swapping it, and maybe it'll work. And there's, there's one or two that I had to swap that didn't look like they should have been, but then it started working. Um, that, that's another thing I want to try to make clear is this number is coming down directly from IPsec in this byte order, and it needs to be compared in this byte order from the web. Now figure out what your spec is going to do, what your chip is going to do with it. <laughs> the other fun one, which is... Um, I, I, have several times between my Intel career and recently now run into this little issue of the original IXGB driver was written for something that was called Oplin. Uh, Oplin was a short-lived 10 gig NIC. Uh, it did its, did its thing in getting the market running and very soon was, short, was followed up by the, uh, the 82.599, the Niantic, and the rest of the family. But they changed the register set. And when they changed the register set, the hardware engineer said, oh yeah, they overlap, it's okay. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> they don't overlap completely. And in fact, there are some bits that completely change names in, in the, uh, the descriptors. Um, and I had to run into that, and I don't know that Don and folks have seen my full patches yet, but there are some bits that I have to change in some long-standing bit, old bit definitions that I have to change in order to make this work. Um, that's okay. I don't know that anyone's using Oplin anyway. Uh, Nick weirdness, yeah, well, uh, registers not cleared on reset, experimentation to figure out, okay, exactly what order do I fill these tables out and when do I do flushes? Kind of a pain. Um, Support from Intel was slow. I'm going to beat on them for this. Uh, I, it took a while to get their attention and say, hey, can you please, please look at this? And, and I was silly enough to think that my personal direct communications would help get, my, get me information. And it did to a point, but I had to go and shake the official tree and say, hey, I need, we need support. Oracle needs support for this. And yeah, that didn't get me very far either, actually. Um, but I really appreciate Jesse Brandenburg's help for, uh, he, he had access to the Windows driver and he was able to go and dig into it a little bit and look at my patch and say, try this. And it, it made a very large difference for me. Uh, we'll get to performance another day. 
So what is there to do left? Um, obviously, checksum and TSO support need to be there. That, that's just, it's got to happen. Um, IPv6, uh, supposedly the chip will do it. Uh, I will be looking at that probably, well, after I get TSO working and IPv4 working fast. There is some advertising of some tunnel support, uh, at least on receive in this chip. And so I, I'll be looking at that a little bit. Um, my simple SA table lookup has got to change. Uh, I'm going to look at what Mellanox did on their hashing, and I'll probably just um, borrow what they did. Uh, clean up some documentation. Um, and I, I want to do some com performance comparisons with Intel's QAT device, uh, which one of its failings is it has to go through the PCI bus a couple of times in order to do the stuff that it's doing. At least that was one of my understandings. And so I, I wanted to do some work with that, and if I have a chance, I see someone going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, hang on just a second. Um, I, I'm almost done. We'll come back to that. Um, so in the, in the uh, uh, spirit of trying to make sure information is available, um, looking at the slides from the last couple of conferences really helped, especially the uh, um, Boris's slides about how to, how to do some of the stuff. And so I thought, well, this was one that... <laughs> These are, these are the, these are the IP, IP route 2 commands that I eventually put together for my testing. And they work great. I figured I may as well put them out there so that other people don't have to figure them all out. Um, and yes, I have a script that does this for me. Um, but uh, that's my test setup for my right and left machines. It works. Uh, other tidbits. Um, um, this was, I think this was Boris, these were Boris's slides. Um, is that right? And then I found, I found a reference to some folks in Germany, uh, and I don't think I put their names down on here. They did a paper um, last year. They were using DPDK and some Lua uh, scripting on top of it to do uh, IPsec offload in IXGBE, and they had some, uh, they had some data out of it. And then the student that was doing that moved off to some other thing, and it never got followed up on. Uh, I heard uh, somebody just sent me a, a message just this morning that someone else on DPDK list is talking about doing some more offload stuff, and I need to go chase that down. Okay, I'll go. I'll go. So Anjali was just saying that uh, DPDK folks just posted uh, patches for this. So I have to go look for that. Okay, questions? Yeah, so a couple of things. You mentioned the Google assist. One problem with that that we've covered is that the ASGCM support doesn't exist in the upstream channel. I think maybe there are some upstream models. Yeah, so, so he's saying Support for QAT and some of its work just isn't all there in the upstream kernel. And, and the biggest and problem is for TSO. Yeah, so much for TSO. I, I, I just remember when I was working near that group at the time, people are going, yeah, this QAT is fun, fast, cool. And, and I'm looking at it going, so what happened to it? It's really it, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beneficial for big packets. Yeah. So that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one final note. Mm -hmm. It, yeah, when Niantic was designed was mid, the mid cent, uh, like 2005 yeah. or so. <laughs> and 
Yeah, and, and the, the, the people that were doing the designing of that chip were not paying attention to Linux. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Um, so thank you. Uh, these slides will be available, and uh, I think my name might be on them somewhere for email. Thank you. Morgan. All right. Good morning. Uh, I'm Josh. This is Don. Same Josh Shannon was talking about, actually. And we're going to be presenting our implementation for IPsec offload in Fortville and our design for support for virtualization. OK, so the focus of our presentation is the virtualization support, because we think we have a solution where we don't have to extend the existing API. Uh, but before we get into that, we want to provide some background into uh, our device and some of the challenges we faced working with it. So what we're working with is basically a normal Fortville with an IPsec agent put right between the Phi and the Mac as a bump in the wire. Um, so what this means is there's no, there's no backplane or uh, control plane for getting configuration or metadata to the IPsec agent. So everything has to go through the Fortville Mac. Um, so our solution for this was using two different L2 ether types to distinguish between control packets or configuration packets and metadata in an IPsec packet. So in the control plane, uh, basically what happens is when the, say, add SA API hook is called, the driver creates a special control configuration packet that it's going to forward through the Mac to the IPsec agent. Um, it has this special ether type already in the packet, and the hardware is set up so that it knows not to mess with it, just forwards it straight to the agent. <coughs> Excuse me. So the agent picks up the packet, it sees the control tag, and it parses the rest of the payload with the parameters for the SSA, basically. It does the programming of the hardware database. Um, it also, the packets have some fields for status and error reporting, so they send it back to the driver, and we know if the ad failed, for example, and it can pass it back up the stack. So the ad was just one example. There's another command for remove, and uh, another one for removing all SAs on a given port for basically cleaning up stale SAs in the hardware database, which will become more relevant for virtualization. So that was the control plane. Now in the data plane, um, basically on egress, when a packet comes down from the stack and says, I need to offload this, the driver's going to do some parsing and figure out, OK, we need the hardware to encrypt this packet. So it's going to create a 32-bit field and put it in a descriptor, which we're going to pass with the packet to the Fortville Mac and the Mac knows to insert our special ether type metadata tag with, with this 32 bits into the front of the packet, <coughs> which is then forwarded to the IPsec agent. The agent knows once it sees this to strip that out of the packet and read the 32 bits of metadata to do whatever processing it needs to. Um, so encrypt or whatever. Similarly, on ingress, when a packet comes in, the agent looks at various fields in the packet does its SA lookup, and if it finds a packet it needs to decrypt, it does that processing, and then it inserts this metadata ether type with 32 bits of metadata, which basically tells us what happened with the decryption, authentication, stuff like that. So that comes up to the Fortville Mac. The Mac knows to strip that ether type and the 32 bits of metadata, metadata out of the packet. It puts it in the descriptor, and passes the packet up, and the driver knows, OK, this is a normal ESP packet. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have 32 bits of metadata now for the processing. So uh, more specifically, what is in the metadata? The most important bit is the offload packet bit for TX. This basically says, OK, we need the hardware to encrypt this packet. 
Um, the, another one is the next header field for the trailer, so the agent doesn't have to do any packet processing on its own. We can just say, hey, this is what it was, put it in the trailer, don't worry about it. <clears throat> and there's, there's some options for other optimizations, but that's what we need for now, for TX. So then on the Rx metadata, we have the uh, error reporting. Did, was it the packet decrypted? Did the authentication fail? Were there any other errors? And we also have an index for the software uh, SAD database. So when, when the add SA command comes down, we actually pass along with the SA parameters a index to a software database to store in the hardware. So when it gets a packet in, it knows what SA it used to decrypt. We can pass that back to the driver and look it up fairly quickly. So we already know what SA was used. So where are we now? We're basically at the same place uh, Shannon is with Niantic. Um, we've seen basic encryption, decryption. Uh, we don't have performance numbers right now. And our design is pretty far ahead of our agent functionality. So the important part is we haven't done any of the virtualization stuff yet. We just want to discuss it kind of. And now we're going to talk about some of the challenges for virtualization. So the big one, multiple SAD domains, and you have multiple VMs running different Ike daemons. They don't know about each other, right? How does SA look up in the hardware when you could have the same parameters for each different VMs, basically? Um, then you have stale SA cleanup. So if a VF offloads a bunch of SAs and is wiped out for some reason, it didn't have a chance to say, hey, clean these up. They're still in the hardware. It could still match on an incoming packet. What do you do then? <coughs> and part of the problem with going through the data plane only is that VFs can create a configuration packet that looks like a control packet for the PF or another VF, and it could mess up somebody's SAD, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and then east-west traffic encrypting between, between two VMs on the same host. And now Don's going to talk about all these in more detail, so I'll hand it off to him. Um, thanks. Uh, Josh kind of gave you a quick overview. We wanted to bring up stuff that we had kind of run into and the solutions we were going to, we had planned to get around it. And um, one of the things that I, I don't know if, I don't remember him mentioning is that the plan was that we wouldn't have to change any of the interfaces into the offload. It would be all with the existing stuff. It'd be stuff we do in the driver to get around these virtualization issues. Um, the first is when we were talking about uh, multiple SA domains, I kind of tried to draw it here. The idea being it, it's relatively simple when you have one SA domain and one Unix instance and one, and the agent. And the agent has all the stuff that's offloaded and the the OS knows all the essays that exist. But when you start dealing with um, VFs, you have multiple o um, SAD domains so that there isn't one entity that actually understands where, every, where all the essays are. And that can lead into problems. Um, and this is an example. Um, the essays are um, unique in a single entity by destination IP, IP um, sec protocol, and SPY. But when you start dealing with multiple entities, it's possible for those to be identical. And so in the example we have here, we have two VMs that have all those fields as identical, but an income pa packet, and one of them is offloaded for, let's say, um, VM1, but VM2 is doing it in software. And the only difference is they're in a different VLAN for this example. A packet comes in, it's destined for VM2, but um, the agent is looking at it and says, oh, this is the same um, SAD domain as VM1, and it decrypts it, sends it up to the stack, and of course bad things happen because the stack's not expecting it to be decrypted. And there are other problems related to that. Um, the way we propose getting around it is to, inside the agent's um, SAB, SAB, D, um, have it also contain a local MAC address and one VLAN so that when a packet came in in the previous example, it would hash to the um, SA table, see that it has one, but then do the additional checks to say what MAC address is this um, destined for and what VLAN. Um, we only picked one VLAN because we are concerned specifically about VLAN or port VLAN, where uh, a VM could essentially be 
having a VLAN ID inserted for it, and it wouldn't even know that. So it couldn't know not it couldn't do the offload. Um, we currently we're planning on just supporting one. VLAN, we could theoretically in the hardware do more, but right now we thought we'd allow that to be um, basically fallback in software. So it's just a matter, a sort of a trade off with complexity in the agent. Yeah? Um, well, oh, for the, for the VLAN IDs? Right. We, we have a bunch of. Um, <clears throat> Basically, whenever they're added, they're going to have to go down, and we'll have we have configuration commands that will set all this stuff up, as Are as there be. Changes on no. We just added the configuration packet. Yeah. And the agent knows to parse it out of there. Right. Right. So you almost think of it as we're extending the key. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, the, and, and Josh also mentioned uh, abandoned essays, an example, somebody you know decides to destroy your VM. In our case, the agent then has these essays in it and it never gets a message telling it these essays aren't useful anymore. Um, and that can lead to all kinds of problems, especially when you give that VF to some other VM. There's agent, um, SAs that exist in the hardware for that. The way we were planning on getting around that is we're going to proxy all SA add and removes through the PF. And that would be done, in our case, through a mailbox message from um, our P a VF driver to the PF. The PF would create the configuration message and send it down to the agent. Um, but what the real advantage is that the PF would then be able to maintain its own database of all the SAs that have been downloaded. So that when, um, in the case where something bad occurred, um, like in this example where we have um, uh, VM1 with um, VF1 has two offloaded SAs, um, it gets destroyed for some reason, at some other point you assign the VF to um, a new VM, one of the first things that happens is it sends a mailbox message down to the PF driver saying, I need resources. So it can't do anything until it gets these resources. But at that time, the PF driver could look through its database and, and say, oh, VF1 has two outstanding SAs. Go ahead, make configuration uh, messages to go remove them from the agent. And when that's finished, only then supply uh, the configuration information the VF needs. So um, essentially, it, it would start off with a clean state. There is no SAs for that VF at that point. Um, in some ways, we were forced to do this because of um, limitations in our hardware, um, or specifically the agent. We initially wanted to um, have the agent, since it's the one that knows all this information come down, keep track of where each SA came from. But um, they were using existing IP, and it was very painful for them to do it. And like John men uh, Josh mentioned, the best they could do is delete everything for a given PF or a given port. And so we needed some other software entity to keep that information and be able to clean up accordingly. Um, the other case we had to deal with, which Josh also brought up a good point, um, was malicious VFs. You know, we're communicating in the data plane, and there's a real disadvantage to that because anybody can create any packet they want. And so, theoretically, you could have some VF where it would just create some configuration message, send it down, and delete an SA, do all kinds of bad stuff. They could also insert metadata in their packets to ask them to be encrypted. Um, so, the way we got around um, this is we were, we, the, the model we have, we're requiring that all the VFs be trusted. So you have to turn on the trusted bit and net and the net device in order to be even capable of this offload. Um, and the way it works then is when the PF driver starts up, and if a device isn't trusted, it's going to insert automatic VLAN tagging, kind of like I was saying about well not VLAN tagging, but L2 tagging. And it's going to insert our metadata tag that we already use for um, our other traffic flows. But the one difference is the first bit, which says do um, do an offload on this packet, which is almost was always set for our other metadata, is now zero. And so that tells the agent when it parses out that header, removes it like it's going to do anyway. Don't do anything else with this packet; just pass it through. 
and so um, the malicious VF can do whatever it wants and it'll just be dumping it on the line like it would normally through Fortville. Um, there's some disadvantages we're adding this 32-bit um, L2 header on all of our um, untrusted packet um, VFs at that point. And um, the next, the next um, one we were running into was east-west traffic. And um, this, of course, can be an, an issue if the hardware has a VV and it's um, then redirecting local traffic and not going through our agent. Because like on the, the diagram we had earlier, you can see it sits underneath the Fortville. So if you don't get in there, you don't get the offload. Um, so at first, our uh, gut reaction was, we'll just go into VEPA mode. And when that way, everything will be routed through the agent. It'll go down to the switch. It'll hairpin and come back up. But um, then our architects informed us that not everybody's top of rack switch can support VEPA mode. And so we need to find a way around that. And so our proposal was to put, um, have another agent, essentially, that's a, a VEB hairpin. And so the idea there being is that we would leave the Fort Phil in VEPA mode, but traffic would go down through the encrypted engine as, if it was offloaded as normal, hit the v, um, VEB hairpin, which would know about all the local um, devices, and then hairpin the, those that are, and then it would go through the decrypt engine as normal. Um, of course, this, just like you said earlier, we need a method in order to tell every time a new address is added, it needs to be reported down to that hairpin. And um, every time it's once removed, the same. But once again, the, it makes it a little, it's not as daunting as you'd think initially because it's not full VB functionality because Fortville's still doing all the routing. All we're doing is saying, oh, this needs to go back. So it, it makes it a little simpler in that mechanism. So those were the problems that we discovered, and like Josh said, we haven't, we don't have the, um, the our agent isn't smart enough yet. It, we should get the first drop uh, about the beginning of December, where we can start playing around with some of this stuff. Um, and even then, it's, it still doesn't have full virtualization functionality until later. But um, we wanted a chance to kind of present all this and see um, if people could poke really nasty holes in it, and then we have to go look at it again. Um, and that was all the stuff we had to, I didn't write up, a, I was going to write up an additional slide set to talk about, um, uh, instead of doing uh, host terminated, device terminated, but I think that would be better in just a general discussion because um, I'm, I'm really sort of answering questions and Angela would be probably much better to be involved in that as well. So, um, any questions in general? Yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry. What? Yeah, go ahead. So basically, you know, people want to have two drivers. Repeat the question. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the question was what motivated to not have a separate driver for the control, uh, for, the, for the agent, right? Or, or, or any kind of controller blanket like connection where you have two agents running together. Yeah. Because that's what we're seeing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a piece of silicon that doesn't know what's going on. And part of the, the trick we were doing is finding ways to put packets through Fortville so it wouldn't modify, it wouldn't do things to them. Or if it did things to them, like in um, you know TSO, we'd know what how to work around that. Yeah. Is this going to be able to handle TSO? Yes. Yeah, and um, we we actually have some extra slides we could talk and share with you about how we're doing that in more detail. Um, and that's why we don't have performance numbers either, like Shannon, because currently it doesn't. So it's a kind of a mute point. Yeah. So the the one thing that I notice out of this is you're forcing your VMs to be trusted. Yes. Do you have customers specifically ask? Do you have a customer that's asking for this, and are they okay with that? Um, I, I think that's a loaded question. I know what you're saying. Yes, <laughs> so Mini said she, I've, I've definitely projected that this was the reason. And there were some reasons, some of the reasons for that actually came down to um, our initial customer we were looking at for this and, and kind of getting an idea of the functionality they wanted. They wanted to have a central pool of SAs and didn't want them um, aligned to individual different domains. So you wouldn't say, you know, you have 20,000 SAs and I'm going to give you this VF 1,000. She wanted just an entire pool and you pull them until they're empty. And if you do that, by definition, you need to be trusted because someone could steal all your SAs and never really leave it, lease them. Yeah, it's the fair definition, right? So if you're going to start the hardware resource, you better be trusted. Yeah. And, and, and so that was the beginning. And then there are other issues we ran into that added not of, if we were to do untrusted, what we need to do is tag every inside every packet we have to put metadata so that you can identify where it came in from so that the agent could make those kind of decisions. There's anyway. uh, another issue which we kind of didn't cover. Um, so in this case, when you're programming the SA, you're actually programming it from the VM and asking the PF to program it. So you have to trust your infrastructure, which may not be true in a lot of cases. So yeah, I mean, those are the things that we are you know, looking into as we go forward, that there are in the cloud uh, environment where you're in, you cannot really trust your infrastructure for, um, and for and some of the things. And the example of that is us proxying the, um, all of the SA ads through the PF. You could say, well, if you're seeing the raw open ads, you have the keys. So you, the PF could essentially save all the keys and do something nasty with them. And, and we thought about ways of, around that, essentially like encrypting between the VF and the agent. But um, it kind of came back to what Anjali said. This is an emulated environment. If you don't trust the hardware or anything beneath you, you probably should do it in software. Right. So, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yes, essentially there's, you know, I mean, this is in the raw. If a configuration message comes down, the way we're doing it is that if you had a trusted VF, you could essentially w put a malicious driver on there and do bad things. Um, you could write your own configuration information. Right. So can't the PF uh, authenticate the VF and can't it also authenticate or, or verify that the configuration change is authorized, that, that the VF is able to do this and that we gain a level of security? Yeah, right. so the PF can. Yes. In this case, your most trusted entity is the PF. I was kind of alluding to the fact that there are cons you know, configurations where you're running a VM uh, and, you know, where your tenant actually does not trust it. But 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 this is kind of yeah. Yeah. You could, except once again, um, 
it could configure, it could um, verify everything coming down through um, the mailbox message where we create the configuration messages. But what would stop one of those VMs to open up a raw socket and create a configuration message that goes directly through Fortville because it doesn't, it looks like a normal L2 packet, it doesn't do any special processing for, and then goes directly to the agent and it doesn't know where it was, it came from necessarily. That, that's so where our... Oh, oh, that, that. Uh, that the issue with that is that it's global across the device, so that if we were to stop that, we could stop that um, configuration tag, but then the metadata tags, we need in order to get the goodness over the Fortville automatically adding the L2 hat tags so we don't have to do any copies or move, the hardware does all that. If once we enable the, that to block those L2 from the VFs, we're also disabling their ability to dynamically all these, add these L2 tags. What? Well, the VF needs to do that for its metadata. Okay. You see what I mean? Yeah. Okay. And, and, and we can, I'd be interested to talk about it more, too, if you'd like to. Yeah. Um, am I eating way up too much time? Okay. So this is, the work you're doing here is basically adding something to an existing chip. Yes. It was designed literally 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, or it was started design 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. How is what you're learning here affecting the future design? Um, is this going to be better supported? Uh, yes, um, and I don't know how much I can go into details, but... <laughs> I want to hear the yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The answer is yes. Um, I can honestly say that every chip after this is going to be more IPsec friendly. And it... Yeah, or crypto friendly. That's even a better way to put it. So. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks, Don and Josh. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is an IPsec update from Melanox. We are going to discuss uh, the recent features that we've been working on. Uh, ESN support is the first. Trail removal, VLAN and encapsulation. A small performance update. And the future, which is, in our opinion, full offload and it's related to virtualization as well. So with ESN, I'm going to start really slow. Uh, there's a problem with sequence numbers in IPsec uh, with the high connection speed. Uh, numbers are depleted really quickly. Uh, so for example, using minimal uh, IPsec IPv4 packets, uh, each packet is uh, 90 bytes and assuming your link speed is 40 gigabits per second. Uh, we are going to deplete 2 to the 25 uh, of the sequence number space each second, which means that in about two minutes you need to renegotiate your security associations, uh, which is uh, which degrades performance and it's quite bad. So even the RFC has mentioned this, that uh, in IPsec you should use uh, extended sequence numbers if you have a fast connection speed. So how do we overcome this? Uh, so ESN, what it means is essentially that in IPsec packets you have the sequence number which is 32 bits and ESN means that you add an additional 32 bits which is out of band. It's maintained with each security association and it's, it doesn't appear in, this, in the packet itself. So it would reduce the number of key re renegotiations that's required uh, in each security association. Uh, and how do we solve that in the hardware offload without becoming stateful? Statefulness is bad for hardware and it's also much more complicated to implement in software as well. So for the sense side, we actually can implement this quite easily. Uh, the way that we are going to do it in Melnox, but probably other ways, is to use the IV. The IV uh, is generated anyhow in hardware in most of the, of the flows we have on transmission. So the way that we do it in the send side is that we simply provide the uh, extended security, extended sequence number in, in the IV field and it's going to be used uh, by hardware to, to calculate 
the, the encryption and authentication correctly. Um, this this is just works. It's it's simple. There's no, nothing actually complicated. Uh, Linux uses the extended sequence number to generate the correct IV uh, eventually. So it's just the same flow. Uh, the receive side is actually more complicated. Uh, uh, what we thought initially that we would need something really stateful, but eventually we came up with something that is stateless. Uh, the way that it works is that uh, software would update hardware periodically, and uh, we th the way I think of it, which makes it easier for me to, to think about it, is that uh, if you think about a, a, a replay window or a window of uh, two to the 32 bits that is moving with the sequence numbers, regardless of, how, of the actual replay window, J just think about the two to the 32 window, then the way ESN works is that you need to, for each incoming packet, you need to use the extended sequence number according to the 232 window that is moving. So if, if we use the slide here, uh, assume that we are in the, this first ESN window, we know that we need to use this ESN1 as long as we are in this window, but uh, if we look at each half of this window, so let's say we start from here and we start receiving packets, we always use ESN1. And this is true as long as the replay window, the replay window is eventually much smaller than 2 to the 32. It's, I don't know. S say the maximum is 256, I think, bits of replay window. So it's somewhere here and it starts moving. So it's going to use ESN1 always. And even if it's the biggest replay window that's allowed by the RFC, which is 2 to the 31, so it's half a window. Okay? That's the maximum that's allowed by the spec. So le let's think about the, the maximum theoretical window, not the Linux window. So it's half a window, and we have it here. And it's going to use the same ESN as long as it doesn't cross the middle, the replay window. So we're going to use ESN1 as long as we don't hit this point here. Once we hit this point, we ask software to update hardware to say, OK, you are ESN1, and possibly you are going to have ESN2. How do you know that? It depends on the sequence number you're receiving from the packet. So after the replay window is completely in this part, so if it's 2 to the 31, it's somewhere either here or somewhere here. So if you get a small sequence number, you, you are essentially saying that it's ESN2. So by updating each half window, you can know which ESN to use according to the packet that is received. So here it's going to be always ESN1, still ESN1, ESN1, possibly ESN2, and the update already happened here. And the update happened sometime in this window. You hardware asks software here, please update. Once, once software sees this, it updates, but the hardware window keeps moving, it moves, it moves, and sometime over here it's going to be updated. And when you start already receiving this packet, it surely has been updated. You, you haven't received two to the 31 packets. So if you think about it, it just makes sense and it works. And the, there are other ways to do it. It's just one example. I, I'm sure everybody would have figured it out after some time of thought into this. You, you look complex, Stefan. What, what do you think? You don't want to maintain the replay window essentially here. S so this is how you do it without any state. You just look at the packet, you know the state of which ESN, is it ESN1 or ESN1 and a half, and, and you know what to do. Uh, no, nothing. You, you just need the update at this, uh, I don't know how to call it, head. At the head places, you, you send the update. The way we suggest to implement it is have the replay protection call call the driver, and the driver in, in these packets, it would just call the hardware, say update, and it works. We have patches we'll probably send soon. So this is how you do ESN uh, in a stateless manner. Uh, RX trailer removal, so something we have noticed w with some tests that we get a 10% performance improvement if we remove the uh, the trailer from IPsec packets on the receive side. Uh, we, we've been able to go from 23 uh, gigabits per second to 25. Um, 
we were really surprised that it was so significant. The, uh, the reason our conclusion was that it saves some cache line pollution by reading the trailer and not reading the trailer. Uh, the only thing that's required is the next header field in the XFRM offload structure. Uh, one drawback is that TCP dump will never see the trailer. Not, not sure if it's that significant. Uh, well, uh, previously it's, it's usually a seen them, uh, maybe after GRO we didn't, yeah. But before GRO it, <laughs> it had a trailer, so <laughs> rip. <laughs> Um, okay, so encapsulations, inside encapsulations is, is what we get once we start doing something like this, like VXLAN ESP TCP, GRE ESP TCP. VLAN ESP TCP is, is another example, but simpler than these ones. Um, what we suggest is, uh, and we have patches for VLANs for this, is that we advertise crypto offload on the overlay device. So. If you have, say, a VLAN device, like uh, VLAN 1 at ETH 0, then you would uh, advertise offload on, on this device, and then the upper device would call the lower device to perform offload and say, I am a VLAN device, please try to offload this, can you do it? And uh, eventually the physical device would uh, either say yes or no. Um, so yes. Yes, so, so what will happen for all of this is that ESP encrypts the payload that's behind it and VXLAN is just normal, or VLAN, like you've suggested. Um, VLAN is simpler because it doesn't have outer IPs, so when you get double encapsulation, something that's uh, not really well defined, how it looks like in Linux, you, you would, uh, it's unclear, for example, what does the inner headers point to and what's the outer. Uh, so this is some of the challenges that we are thinking about and how to, we are not sure yet how to address those. Yes. So if you have any ideas, uh, except the overall infrastructure, any comments, please. Uh. No, so, so, say you don't do, like today you have VXLAN with TSO, uh, say you, you want VXLAN with IPsec offload and TSO, like something crazy like that. Okay, small performance update. So what we have here is a single stream uni unidirectional TCP measured using uh, NetPerf with an IPsec tunnel with uh, 256-bit keys, ASGCM, on our uh, Innova IPsec, it's 40 gigabit uh, NIC. Uh, and the message size is the size that you call your uh, uh, syscall with. So starting from small message size and increasing to 16K. Uh, as we see, the uh, single stream is being saturated. Uh, here it's not saturated, it reaches the limit 25 gigabits already at uh, maximum MTU packets at uh, 15K. Um, so this is currently our uh, maximum performance. Uh, the bottleneck is, is receive side. Uh, so this is the reason we are considering improvements to the receive side. For instance, the JRO patches that Yossi have suggested. We, we have work to do there, but uh, I really hope we, we could improve further and maybe reach full line rate for 40 gigabits uh, using a single stream. Um, but we still have a long road ahead. So full offload, uh, we intend to support it in, in our ASIC. It's going to be called Connectix 6 lx um, There are all kinds of requirements that are required to move from what we have now, which is in a sense a partial offload to a full offload. Uh, ESP, NCAP, DCAP, uh, replay protection, and, I, and IPsec policies all need to be uh, expressed and somehow applied by, by hardware. Uh, there are lots of benefits of this. Uh, what we mean here in SRAOV is that the hypervisor can configure the, the IPsec flows, uh, uh, unlike the previous presentation where uh, you were discussing virtualization, but essentially the VM was configuring the, the security associations and everything, and here we suggest that the hypervisor configure everything, and, and the, the virtual machine it doesn't know that there's IPsec being applied. It's similar to what you have in, say, a power, power virtual setup where the hypervisor or the host machine provides uh, IPsec. Uh, so this is something we call unaware IPsec. 
Um, there are other benefits such as RSS according to inner fields. If you remove the IPsec entirely in hardware, you get RSS according to inner fields, which is uh, more scalable. You, you get LRO for TCP. Uh, ESK, ESP encapsulation of, with any other supported encapsulation, which is something we've mentioned in the previous slide. But here in the virtualization use case, which is usually uh, more common. Um, for the control path, we think that what we need, the, the most essential thing is the security policy, add and delete, in, in addition to the security association. This is needed to tell hardware which uh, packets are going to be used for each security association, something that previously we didn't need to do, so we probably would ex uh, extend IP route to, to add that and then the driver will need to bind uh, the security association, the security policy um, once the security association is added after the policy has been created initially. Uh, not sure if we would need anything else since, since we uh, didn't really start implementation yet. Well, it, it shouldn't matter. It could be done like live, like while you're doing it. Uh, essentially, the hypervisor could catch, uh, say, the packet while it's going out uh, from the VM, go, go to the hypervisor, configure security association, does everything, and then traffic continues. Um, uh, for data path, we have a few exceptions. Uh, for instance, uh, IP fragments are going to be accept an exception. And we would need somehow to do it in the hypervisor. So uh, the hypervisor would catch those IP fragments that, that are intended for IPs of virtual machines, uh, process them, and provide them to the VF eventually. Uh, another option is uh, to drop, which is much simpler, but I think people won't be happy with that. Um, uh, this uh, fallback or data path exception is somewhat similar to what exists today in OVS offload where they have the slow path and the fast path. So you can think about IP fragments as a slow path for IPsec offload in that sense. Right, L like you have in OVS slow path where, where you go to the, to the stack instead of offload in, in all the talks of or, uh, all Gerlitz and Lonnie Flying, they're talking it on that every time, but you probably didn't listen, so. Right, to the stack in the hypervisor where, where it does real, real software and encrypts and everything and just f finishes uh, by providing it to the VF eventually. So that's all I have. Right, sure, yeah. Like if there was not enough space for uh, For example, yeah, or if you have some hash conflicts or something, if you have a cam or whatever. Yes? If you're looking at uh, VMs that don't know that you, or guests that don't know that there's IPsec going on underneath, what do you do with guests that are doing their own IPsec as well? Well, this is the offload that uh, they were talking about previously in the, in the Intel talk. Uh, not, not necessarily uh, uh, hardware offload, but if they... But if if they're the, doing their own the software offload, do you have, are you thinking about, you know, should we bother doing a hardware offload if they've already encrypted their message? Well, well, well it's a that? service that, uh, like, y you are providing a, cl a cloud and virtual machines to clients, and the, you provide a service of IPsec. Today, what you do is you do power virtualization, and you do it on the hypervisor. Uh, there are all, ki all kinds of such services, uh, Amazon, whatever. Um, So you can provide a service, so the VM can do whatever. It doesn't matter; just a different model. And if the VM isn't aware of the services that are already happening, it may suck down more CPU than me. Well, well, usually there is a client that purchases the service, and he pays some dollars for it. So yeah. we probably should yeah. do something that makes sense. Yes. It should. <laughs> it should, yeah. <laughs> Earlier, when you have the 
So we have sort of a flow match an action thing in, in both transmit and receive. So we would use that and it could be extended to other encapsulations. So in terms of configuration, usually today you, you can configure from the hypervisor VLANs for, for the VM or VXLANs or whatever. And the, then those configurations would be applied before the SA lookup, so you, you would always need to walk through that, and then you would do the SA lookup on transmit. And on the receive side, you, you have the, the other way around, you, you need yeah, to the walk the. Like the well, we have a cam there, so it's simpler. Than so we have a cam that's simpler yeah, than an index. Have, have I was trying to figure out what is, what is your flow match better, which you yeah, I'm not sure I understand, but you, you have the VAF rules before the, the IPsec rules that are after, so just goes directly. And when you configure them, they are applied automatically to the IPsec rules. Thank you. Okay, there's still the time, and we are at the open discussion part. Is there anybody who wants to step up to discuss something? <coughs> Pardon me? You, you mean the contract thing? Yes, exactly. Ah, okay, yes. So yeah. yeah. Right. Yes, I mean, I think the easy solution to that is to do it like IPv6 does it, right? I mean, IPv6 takes all the fragments, reassembles it, and then contract checks the reassembled packet, but passes the um, fragment chain back to the stack. So, not anymore? Oh, okay. So, I'm outdated. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I'm not so sure either. Yeah, no, that's not that's not the way how to do it. <laughs> I think contracts should somehow pass the packets back to the stack as they were. I mean, that's. Somehow the easiest, at least for from a stack point of view. Yes, right. Okay. Okay, then let 
Yeah, that would be good, yeah. Okay, anything else? Okay. I have a small question on the DPI devices. Yes. So uh, we have uh, a setup where we act as a responder, uh, so with, uh, multiple initiators are uh, contacting the same responder from uh, behind the net. Um, it seems like it's not going to be possible to use DPI devices that we cannot use overlapping addresses because it is not uh, marked based, doesn't believe the arbitration mark based. Yes. No, I think, well, I mean, the VTI interfaces are, well, how to say, they're not that well designed. <laughs> yes, and, um, well, I have one more topic, namely it was redesigning the VTI interfaces, so maybe I would just like present this and maybe it fixes your thing then. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's where we were, this happened, this happened. Okay, yeah, so I have a discussion point, namely it's redesigning VTI. I mean, VTIs have some disadvantages due to not so good design. So I wrote some of the disadvantages here. This is first thing is a VTI interface is a layer 3 tunnel and this has configurable tunnel endpoints. But the thing is that the tunnel endpoints are already determined by DSA, so configuring these tunnel endpoints doesn't make much sense because if, you, if it doesn't match DSA, it just doesn't work, right? <laughs> okay, another thing is that, well, you can have a VTI with wildcard tunnel endpoints, but only one. And that's, that's another limitation because you certainly want to have this all VTIs should have wildcard tunnel endpoints because. <coughs> Pardon me? Yes. Right. Yeah, I mean, they should not have tunnel endpoints at all. It should just an interface. Yeah, and just having one of these tunnel interfaces could be problematic if you need it for multiple namespaces. You already get in trouble there. So there's no chance to do this currently. Another thing is the configuration. <laughs> it's <laughs> configured with GRE keys and routing marks, which is somehow odd, I would say. I mean, neither the GRE keys nor routing marks were made for that. And during that, routing by mark doesn't work that well. I don't want to say it doesn't work at all, but <laughs> it doesn't work so well. Another thing is that the VTI is just for tunnel mode SIs, which is also a limitation, and what is not really needed. So it's not an interface where you can route transport or beat mode with. And I want to overcome this. Well, first thought I can fix VTI, but I think this will lead to incompatible user space problems. So my plan is to create some new interfaces. I think that's <laughs> pretty much easier. <laughs> So, and yeah, so I have a wish list how they should look like. And well, it should just be a virtual interface. Everything you wrote in should be IPsec transformed. That's it, not more and less. Then I do not want to have the limitation on the mode. All of the mode should work with that. And multiple interfaces should be possible. So we can move into different namespaces. Another thing is the VTI interface, if you route something through a VTI interface, you should know if this is layer 4 or layer 6 encapsulated, otherwise you get problems. So, and this is also something, it should not be a layer 3 interface, you should route anything in that and it should fall out IPsec processed after that. Yes, and this is my configuration idea. So the interfaces become a mark and a mask for input and output, and that must match input and output mark of the state. We currently got support for an output mark of the state, which is used for routing by mark now, and we would have to extend the state for an input mark, and that's how I think we can configure these new interfaces. Well, that's basically my ideas on that, but the question is, is there anything else? I really want to avoid that we get yet another interface that's almost what we want to have, so we should get it right now. So, 
Yeah. Yes, right. Yeah, good point. Yeah, you can think about this, yes. Some more things. Actually, I have already code for that. I haven't posted it yet, but I think I will do it during the next weeks. And then, if you have ideas on that, just let me know, and we can adapt this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, anything else? Some more topics? Okay. If not, then thanks for coming. <laughs>